Hi, I'm Shlomi Ron. I'm the co-founder of the Visual Storytelling Institute based here in sunny in Miami, Florida. And one of the top questions we get a lot from our clients is what makes a good brand narrative or business story effective? And our answer always seems to be the same because definitely you need to have a great product, but at the end of the day, it really depends on how deep you know your customer. And for this exact point, I'd like to uh, introduce you today to a great guest uh, on our show today, Tori Gentis. Uh, Tori is based in Colorado, and she is an immersive ethnographer and partner at the Palmerstone Group, uh, where she answered pretty much the same uh, question, you know, why the why behind human behavior uh, for major brands like uh, Nike, Coca-Cola, uh, Cirque du Soleil, and others, including a wide range of NGOs around the globe. Uh, in 2015, Tori was the recipient of the Young Professional Grant from the Qualitative Research Consultants Association, and she was also recognized as the first American winner to receive the 2017 uh, Qualitative Excellence Award from the same uh, organization, and this is one of the top honor in her industry. Wow, this is a fantastic <laughs> accomplishment story. And we're super excited to have you today. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Honored to be here. This is my first video podcast, so should be interesting. Yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, it's, it's a way for us to bring uh, some of the top uh, visual storytelling experts uh, from a variety of the uh, aspects of the discipline and uh, help uh, our audience learn more how they can uh, perfect their uh, craft uh, and that's why we thought uh, ethnography is is really one of the most uh, not talked about uh, areas in marketing and especially when you're trying to understand who is your customer yeah and and really get to the bottom of what made them tick in order to come up with a, an effective uh, marketing strategy in our case is uh, the whole visual storytelling strategy yeah so with that uh, i wanted to kind of flip back the pages to where you really uh, got started with your journey and maybe you can tell us you know you know what was your backstory and how yeah. come you kind of started with ethnography that's the fun stuff i'd love yep. it i'm gonna try to give you the cliff notes because i could go yep. down so many rabbit holes but You'll have to bear with me and I'll give sure. you kind of the overarching structure. But the cool thing about qualitative market research and ethnography kind of fits under that umbrella is that I have yet to meet one qualitative researcher that had a linear path um, to mm -hmm. that discipline. So it's not like being a lawyer or accountant. They right. all come from different backgrounds. They found their way through different methods and, and mine was kind of the same thing. So my backstory is really... I was doing ethnography before I even knew it had a term or that it was huh. called that. Yep. Um, and it was just because I think those skills came really natural to me. So for years, I kind of beat myself up uh, around the fact that like, what do I have that's this tangible on paper um, skill to offer? And I really totally discounted the softer skills of being able to connect with strangers, you know, to gain mm -hmm. trust in 20 sure. seconds of meeting them and, and hear their stories and have them really open up and, and tell you their, you know, most intimate thoughts. And that always came natural to me. I was always the one, you know, I mean, now we're going back 10 years ago, but in college at the parties, I'd be in the back room with the girl crying on my shoulder because she's sharing her whole life story and everyone's in the front room drinking. I just happened to be that person that, that people really gravitate to. So I went to Syracuse University, graduated 2010 from the entrepreneurship program, um, mm -hmm. which was great because it was very much more of a hands-on program, less about in the classroom and more about working with real entrepreneurs and mm -hmm. consulting for their businesses. And, um, after graduating, I was, I was there at a really ripe time where the university was uh, really supporting student entrepreneurs and their businesses. So they actually incentivized me and paid me to stay after I graduated to work mm -hmm. on my own business. And at the time, it was a t-shirt company called Squeeze right. My Tees. <laughs> yes. And so I got to spend a year basically connected to free resources of uh, mentors and office space and uh, accountants, lawyers, and that kind of thing. So Long story short, I ended up then staying another year um, because I had recognized an opportunity on campus that was kind of being missed 
in terms of a chancellor's mission. So she was at the time really focused on getting entrepreneurship out of the business school and into all of the different disciplines right. on campus, the art sciences, engineering, but campuses can be very politically driven and very protective. Yep. So I, I had proposed a position that said, hey, hire a recent graduate who still looks like a student that way, you know, it's you totally play up what the perception is on from the outside. Like better journalist, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I thought of it as like being a mole on campus. And so I got that position funded and um, mm. approved. And then I actually applied for it and was awarded it. And the job was student entrepreneurial consultant, which meant I helped the students with their businesses. But then the other side of it was going um, all across campus and talking to the various deans and trying to figure out what their needs were, what their their fears were, what their challenges were, what they were trying to protect, um, and with a very non-threatening kind of face, because I still look like a student, be able to get even underground the, the layer that the chancellor couldn't get. So the top down wasn't working. It had to go from the bottom up. So it was really aligning these incentives of what do the students need, what do the deans need, and how do we accomplish the goal of getting entrepreneurship across disciplines. And Got it. so Again, that was, I guess, a perfect example of what we do in qualitative research is, is understanding the population and figuring out how to align the business goals. So I had no idea that's what I was doing at the time, um, but that was kind of my, my first leg into it. And then after that, uh, the little voice in my head, I always wanted to go overseas. So one-way ticket to Africa, um, planned to be maybe three or four months, but a year and a half, two years later, I came home and I had spent time going throughout Africa and Southeast Asia and helping entrepreneurs start their businesses too. So I helped start a um, food and uh, food delivery program in mm -hmm. South Africa under the umbrella of a bigger um, grocery store chain. And in Thailand, I helped create a um, Wi-Fi westernized sit-down coffee shop that acted as a revenue generator for all the other nonprofit initiatives they were doing. And in both cases, um, the same principles applied. I was in the communities. I was participating in the communities. I was understanding everything from the business to the emotional level um, in order to, to accomplish the goal, which I, and you know, I just, it came natural, I suppose, but I still didn't really know where that fit and how that skill right. could be applied. Um, so then fast forwarding to now in the background, my now business partner initially was always a fantastic mentor and he's the one that I have to credit for even um, telling me, showing me that there's a world of qualitative market research. <laughs> Uh, so he, I was lucky to work on some of his projects and, and now years later, I'm partner with that company and doing oh, wow. full blown market research, qualitative market research projects. Oh, that's awesome. This yeah. is fantastic. So it sounds like, you know, it, it, it's mostly like a lot of people say, you know, they stumble by mistake to their profession and looks like that was the case with you that, uh, you started in, in school and, and look, kind of like it and saw the benefits, the value that you could bring by basically leveraging your natural native uh, skills of uh, making people open up to you, it sounds like. Yeah. And share and, stuff, which is a really rare uh, skill set to have. <laughs> yeah. And I think like what's interesting too is I never even still today, I have to admit, I don't see it as um, – following a career as much as I do following a lifestyle. And that was the one right. thing I always did know that I loved, which, you know, was traveling people, embedding myself in culture, asking questions, um, being curious always. Um, and so I, it, I guess the, the industry kind of, it just fit the lifestyle. Um, right. yeah. And yeah, happened to yeah. align. So here I am. <laughs> yeah. The win-win are always the best, right? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So, you know, <clears throat> we have, uh, as I'm, mentioned marketers in the, in the audience that uh, most likely <clears throat> are interested in uh, finding, okay, this is fantastic uh, discipline, but how can I take advantage of it? So can yep. you kind of uh, zero in on uh, the definition more about uh, what uh, ethnography research means? Uh, you know, what are the top categories and, and yep. what are the core benefits for marketers and businesses? Absolutely. So, <laughs> It's helpful to put the context, again, thinking about qualitative market research as the umbrella, uh -huh. and then um, ethnography being really one methodology to design a research study um, of many, because you could mm -hmm. do you know, focus groups, which is the classic two-way mirror, one-way mirror with your clients in the back and eight right. people in the front, and you're moderating, mm -hmm. 
or you can do phone IDIs or uh, interviews just like we are webcam. Yep. So um, the way that I define ethnography um, is really taking the tr taking it past the traditional way of conducting market research, which a lot of times exists in a facility, which is a very, you know, kind of conferency sterile environment. And given my background, I just always prefer to do things much more on the ground level because I think it brings a level of authenticity. So you become the person that you're, you're studying. Um, and there shouldn't be any rules. There shouldn't be any boundaries. I think the world is your focus group. So ethnography for me, and it's, you know, my own definition is really collecting scrappy ground level insights straight from the moment that things are happening in real time, meeting people where they are given whatever topic you're, you're studying um, and meeting them there and intercepting, intercepting them in those locations to get the raw experience and mm -hmm. feedback and real time um, ex story that they have to share. And do you find yourself in mostly, it sounds like you're focusing mostly on the offline space, but do you find any interaction with the online, maybe kind of a, Yep. hearing something offline and then kind of validating this in social media to see if there's a match. Totally. I love that you, mm. that you brought that up because to answer another question that you asked earlier, um, the budgets for these types of projects are all over the place. Obviously it's very different if a company like Coca-Cola is hiring you than right. a small startup. Um, and I don't ever want the budget to be uh, a barrier, you know, to entry to do qualitative research because really yeah. anybody can do it. Yep. Um, so that said, yeah, I've, I've dabbled in doing uh, this thing called social listening, which is not any face-to-face -face interviews, but rather taking the topic and then, I mean, manually just spending the time in the saddle looking at all the social commentary. So, for example, and you can get really scrappy with these ideas too. So, um, let's say it's about financial investing and maybe there's a company that wants to offer a new retirement um, mm -hmm. product. Yep. And normally, I mean, people are pretty tight lipped about something personal like financing and, and their attitudes and behaviors around it. So I took that project on and the goal was to just do the social listening piece, looking at the organic natural conversations. And um, one thing I found really fruitful, which you just, you wouldn't normally think this way, but book reviews. So if you read all the commentary under book reviews, find the, any book based on the topic that you're studying and people are giving reviews, not just about, you know, book was great, book was bad, but they're also incorporating why they think that. And often the why they think that has to do with their, their attitudes or orientation around the topic itself itself or the beliefs that they have around it. Um, so yes, there's this nice, beautiful um, combination and I've done it where you could do the social listening piece online just to help guide the types of questions and maximize um, your time face to face once you do those right. interviews. Or it could come later and really beef up um, the the artifacts that you have to show. And it it's really cool because in that example, I was able to do both. I did the online listening and then we did interviews and the themes were so consistent, which is great. I mean, that's what you wanna you wanna find. So yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I, I find this whole space really fascinating because, um, you know, when we are uh, work with our clients, we use our nine step framework and your area fits beautifully in our story making phase, which is really where we learn more about who is the, the customer. We call it the hero of your story yeah. and and really what makes them tick and, you know, what conflict they're trying to solve. And typically, you know, and I'm sure you, you you agree. I mean, basically, there is a uh, four areas that uh, customers are really operated in. One is what they feel, mm -hmm. think, do, and say. Right, totally. and and the do and say is is what we typically consider the visible part. The the most challenging part is really getting into what they think and feel, which is more d deeply. Uh, buried and you can get it only indirectly yeah. by searching online to see if they share it like you said with the reviews you know when they share the why but i'm kind of wondering how you get into the deepest levels of the think and feel totally yeah and i mean there's so many ways to answer that so one thing that just came to mind which 
is the beauty of qualitative research, especially when you're doing that one-on-one -on -one interview is mm -hmm. a lot of times, because people don't know, right? They don't know why they do the things. And I ask questions that they're like, geez, I've never, I never thought about that. And you get people that are just better at answering and, and right. those that just, they just, they're not thinking that way. So the beauty of doing that in person is sometimes I'll get someone that kind of feels like they're just saying what <clears throat> makes sense to say or what they, they think, you know, the answer is right. and the beauty, beauty around creating that trust and that rapport and almost you get them to forget that it's research and you're, they're talking to a friend is you can kind of call them out and say, but, but wait, do you actually do that? But do you really do that? And the number of times like, no, I, nope, I don't, I guess I don't. And you know, oh, and so, and you can kind of laugh about it. And then it's like, okay, well, let's break that down further. And another thing that I do too is, is in the beginning of the um, interview before it's even started is I kind of set the ground rules and I tell them there's no right or wrong answers. So that part is no pressure on you. This is sure. literally from your experience. Um, and uh, I just lost my train of thought. Um, yeah, we're thinking about the, we're talking about the, you know, how do you kind of Oh, devil's uncover. advocate. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So in the beginning, I'll set the ground rules and I'll say, like, I'm going to ask you questions that are going to sound like I'm trying to um, convince you of something or push you in one direction or the other, mm -hmm. but that's not the intent. My job is to be devil's advocate because the purpose is to get even deeper under those layers. And I find that that works really well because huh. without that context, the, the questions could sound kind of conflicting, right? Like right. even just saying, but, but do you really do that? I mean, is that really? And so when you set that context, it really kind of like sets people at ease that they know, okay, you're asking this question, not because you're trying to sell me or you're trying, you know, to convince me to go to this gym versus that gym. It's really just a really effective way to, to pitch two things against each other and get deeper insights. Yeah. And, and, and also I think, you know, when you kind of start the maybe kind of sharing your vulnerability in in the in the context you know then it's kind of humanize uh, humanize your uh, you know ask and people tend to kind of uh, as you said treat you as a friend and share more uh, authentically you know totally. their thoughts and beliefs and uh, so it's kind of an exchange the minute that you get the sense that the people you're talking to have forgotten that you are asking them questions for a reason other than you're just a friend in their group is when you know you've really been successful, which is why I love that street level research because like I've intercept people in the bathroom line mm -hmm. or I might like a way in to a stranger on the street. You see them taking a photo. Oh, can I take that photo for you? Oh, sure. Sure. You take their photo and then you've already kind of gotten past that first, you know, uh, awkward, I guess, layer of trust. Um, and then it opens up that natural organic conversation. So yeah, so you got to start with making initial deposit somehow. <laughs> exactly, and it takes thick skin too. I think that's the big one of the biggest yeah. learnings about this is it can be really easy and safe to do research in the facility because someone else has recruited your 15 people. All you have to do is show up and ask your questions from your dis discussion guide, and not to discount it because that takes work too. Um, but I think the reason that people don't just open the front door and go have a conversation is, is our own, um, anxiety, you know, talking to strangers and getting past that first approach right. and knowing that you, you'll get rejected and that's okay. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think what you're trying to do in essence is really to kind of break the, the classic mold of, uh, you know, the, the sensor survey that comes with the pad and knock on the door and. People yeah. kind of frame you as, as a researcher running yeah. a survey and they're most likely going to reject it. But if you kind of flow in naturally to what they're already doing and not appearing, you know, as a, interrupting anything, but if anything, you are complimenting what they're trying to do. Exactly. And that's something that, but I'm kind of curious, are you getting any rejection sometimes? <laughs> You know, minimal, I have to say for all the times that I've done this, um, there's only a couple of times that I was flat out rejected and something interesting about getting rejected. So I did a project, I drove coast to coast, um, New Hampshire to California, mm -hmm. and I stopped random strangers and asked them to tell me a secret. And so, I mean, that's really kind of uh, abrasive. You're walking up to someone and I'm, now I want to know a secret within 20 seconds. Right. And it was incredible because I really only got rejected one time and it was 
actually because of me. I could even feel in my body that I, I don't know, I was just thrown off. You know, there was just, I sure. wasn't totally comfortable and I made that approach and I approached two businessmen probably on their lunch break in Cincinnati walking in suits and here I am kind of looking like a hobo and I could already tell they were like turning their bodies the other way as I approached them. Um, so it's actually just as much about you and, and your energy that you're, you're bringing to it. And then of course there's all those tricks and tips to comfortably um, intersect somebody. And another thing that really helps too, and the incentives can be really small. So for example, mm -hmm. I did a um, project in Las Vegas for a huge entertainment company. Mm -hmm. And um, it was all about understanding the millennial experience in Vegas for the 72 hour window on average that people spend um, time there. And so I had had a bunch of like $15 New York, New York roller coaster passes. And so I was doing these street intercepts and intercepted a gentleman in the bathroom line. So then there was already that reason to start the conversation and then made it that much easier. Hey, would you be willing to, you know, talk to me for a little bit? I have some of these uh, roller coaster passes. And, and if you're really willing, maybe I can interview you on the roller coaster, which does a couple of things. Um, one, I mean, it's offering this incentive and now you've breaking, broken that barrier of this is not research. We're, we're friends and we're doing something fun. And then in terms of the storytelling piece, what an incredible thing video. I took a video of the, mm -hmm. uh, the interview on the roller coaster to include into the report, um, to the client. And in this case, it was like that one little moment of riding a roller coaster and asking him the, you know, the perfect questions with the backdrop of the setting it just mm. throws my audience, my clients into that experience, like, you know, to the, to the ninth degree where it's not just what he's saying. I mean, Absolutely. It, we're physically in the moment doing it. Yeah. But I get a sense, obviously that you, you got to play a gradual road here in terms of how you kind of ease in into the dialogue. As you can, you said, you cannot really just break in with your most, with your actual question right off the bat because totally. it will tend to kind of scare people off. Yeah. That's awesome. So uh, now that we got a sense of a, a little bit about uh, what ethnography means and how you use it in practice, um, can you tell us, you know, from a, a business perspective, you know, obviously you work with a wide range of uh, clients by now. What are the typical business objectives they seek? Sure. Yeah. And that's, again, like all my answers is very, very wide spectrum. So you can literally go from the highest level of business questions to very specific. So the highest level being even something as simple as, well, going back to the millennials, we want to understand this population, millennials, in the context of Vegas. And there was like really no rules on it. It wasn't about trying to figure out why aren't millennials purchasing tickets to this entertainment company um, and their shows. It was more of, well, how are they making decisions about spending their time and their money in Vegas, which is very different than they do back at home. So that was very much, you know, the high level look of the client just wants to understand the, the population and that population could be their existing um, target customers, or it could be um, customers that they're hoping to acquire mm -hmm. um, or, you know, a new service or product that will attract new customers and they want to start gauging um, if there's a fit there and then that can literally be funneled down to something as specific as we've the advertising agency has developed this concept um, that might be a commercial and, and you know maybe it's just like sketches and imagery um, to testing reactions with the relevant population about that well what do you think about this like what does it conjure mm. up what are your emotions sure. what are your feelings? so it's you know hedging the bet before that investment of actually producing whatever yep. that that ad might be um, and another use that's really cool, and I, I love this side of it too, is employee engagement. So companies that want to really understand the the um, the, the culture, culture. And, yep. and the mood of what's happening in their own company, and they, you know, the top down doesn't work. So a third party coming in and saying, "Listen, this is another strategy I use. Nothing you say is going to offend me, and and frankly, I don't care. I care about mm. what you're saying, but I really don't care, you know, if you like it, dislike it, or not." And so. Yeah, and employee engagement is another example of, of how this oh, yeah, no, work is probably used. it's big. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So in cases where the client is interested in uh, maybe perfecting uh, their overall brand narrative, so 
typically I, I tend to define a brand narrative as a, if you think of a necklace, yeah. like the entire necklace is your brand narrative. And each bead is representing a little story that kind of yeah. support the overall necklace. Yeah. So w when you get a request from clients to kind of uh, help validate a brand narrative, how can you actually use a, a ethnography to kind of build a, and shape the story? Yeah. Um, yeah. And it, it, also depends, I think, if it's, you know, a legacy brand that's been a around a while or the a new brand that's um, people mm -hmm. don't really know about and at what stage you're intercepting people. Um, but a lot of times that's kind of going beyond what the actual product and service is and almost taking the values that the company is standing by um, and those other non-communicated values that go into their brand and seeing how those fit in the eyes of their consumer's life. And you might even talk to consumers, not even about, you know, what the, the product or service is, mm. but just what those values mean to you. And then, and then start making that leap into, well, which, which companies, you know, come to mind when you really, when you think about someone that does that well or plays wow. that role for you. Um, and also one little trick that I, or question that I love using, and, and maybe it's kind of, cheesy, but it just works is saying, if you're trying to compare, like, where does your brand fit, you know, in a host of other competitors, um, asking someone, okay, imagine you're hosting a party and you can adapt this question to whatever's relevant. So maybe, maybe they play soccer. You could be like, imagine you're a coach on a soccer team. And I'm literally making this mm -hmm. up, but imagine you're a coach on a soccer team and you have, um, players from X, Y, and Z brand, you know, all in the same space. And they're showing up to play on your team what are they wearing? What kind of player are they? What, how collaborative are they? Um, are they like an I person? Are they a team person? You know, and you just start kind of personifying those characters. Um, and you could use anything. You, if the person's a, a, a car enthusiast, you could be like, okay, here's X, Y, and Z brand. Which car would they be? And, and give me as much detail around that. How much would they be sold for? Where, you know, what, what kind of person's driving that car? Um, this is so like yeah. in a perfect world, basically, you would say, you know, how would you imagine those, this, this context? Yeah. You're like, okay, if somebody was personified from that company, um, you know, and I keep an easy one, like Coke, Pepsi, you know, some of the big, um, mm -hmm. soft drink brands and you say, okay, somebody from Coke is showing up to my soccer team. What are they wearing? What kind of attitude? Uh, what do they look like? What kind of player are they? Pepsi's on the team. What do they look like? So you, it is a bit you know, and you've got to make sure the person can think that way because it, it's, it's role playing in a way of storytelling. Right. Yeah. And people can, people can answer it, you know, and you get mm -hmm. some really surprising answers and then it's the follow up. Why? Well, why are they wearing that ridiculous outfit? What, it, why did they choose that? What does that say about them? Um, so it's amazing. You can get a lot of depth from not even talking about, you know, the soft drink itself. Yeah. We t I tend uh, sometimes to use a, uh, one of my favorite sandwiches is the caprese. Yeah, good <laughs> and, one. Yeah, and I, I tend to use that example in the presentation. Basically, whenever I, I need to kind of describe the, what a great brand narrative looks like. So, you know, the top slice is the, the business story. Yeah. The, the bottom slice is, is the customer story. And the feeling is really the must have solution or the pain point that, uh, yeah. you know, the client's trying to solve. Right. So ideally, if you have a great uh, brand narrative, it should really kind of uh, echo the, the pain point that your customer is having. Yep. So, so the moment you're going to tell your story to your audience, hopefully they're going to hear their voice Exactly. In that story, and they say, hey, this is my pain he's talking about. And at that moment, that brand narrative that's coming from the brand stops becoming their story, becomes the customer's story. That's exactly it. Yep. And there's a good example. I did a, a project with a, um, what would you call them? I guess tax prep mm -hmm. help um, provider. And so we're talking to people about filing their taxes. I mean, it could be couldn't get any more boring than that, but it wasn't boring because you heard stories like, well, my uncle or my grandpa always files my taxes, but 
man, they don't actually do a good job. And yeah. <laughs> also I feel guilty not going with them because they say, why would you hire someone? You don't have to pay for it. And then the story after that became, you know, the commercial of don't let your crazy aunt or crazy uncle, you know, crazy grandfather do. So it very much resonated with that wow. voice. And also just to add to what you're saying, the confusing thing about qualitative, I think can be, you can find the voice that's going to back up whatever you want to say. So that can get really confusing for brands because they're going to say, well, someone said this and they said this, and then this other person said this, where do we go? And that's your crazy sandwich example, because now you're aligning, well, what do we do best and what do we want to stand for? And then, okay, which part of the population um, is kind of speaking our language and aligning those two instead of getting lost in the mud of like, well, now we got to do, we got to do everything. It's more of figuring out, okay, but who do you want to speak with and what is their story? Cause there's going to be multiple stories always. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, I think that top slice that represent the brand, I think it's also important. It shouldn't be like kind of a hundred percent mirror of, of, you know, the customer because they also bring uh, their backstory. They have their own origin story of how they got started, their own personality. So definitely you want to, portray that and bring that to the equation but at the yes. same time we also know that you know one of the recent studies talk about the uh, specifically specifically in the startup space 70 percent of the you know the ventures are really failing and yeah. they try to figure out why you know there was no market need <laughs> so basically you know yep. they are operating in an environment where they try to solve a nice to have problem. You know, the customer don't care about, doesn't care about their problem. And exactly. So that's an example of, you know, why it's important to really get uh, to the bottom of that. You have a real need, real pain point to solve. Exactly. But, and that you're speaking their language too. Cause sometimes yeah. it could be just how you're, yeah. How you're packaging that exactly. solution. Yeah, um, it, it's always like that. It's obviously you gotta have a great product or service. That there's no doubt. But yep. the other part, you can have the greatest Ferrari, but if you don't know how to communicate it, you know, right. you're gonna stay in the garage, right? Exactly. So, <laughs> so that that part about uh, you just what you just said, you know, being able to communicate with the customer language, yep, and portray their pain points is absolutely uh, critical. Mm hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, so one of the things that uh, uh, is also kind of a, a lot of interest for a lot of marketers is uh, we kind of touched briefly on it uh, before when you talked uh, about uh, social media listening. Yep. But uh, typically, you know, marketers today, you know, depending on your size, but if you are, let's say, medium and up, you most likely have a, an agency that's working for you. And yep. you might have a, one small marketing team in house. Yep. And they're most likely running your own paid and earned media. And that covers a digital and social as well. Yep. Uh, but for the heavy lifting, they might outsource uh, the work to you know, their agency. They're going to produce their weekly, monthly, you name it, reports. Yep. So uh, can you? Talk a little bit about, uh, you know, the interplay. So as you run an ethnography projects and try to get the essence of what people are saying, what tools are you using uh, both in the field and, how, and what tools are you using in the online space? Yeah. Yeah. Lots of different things. So in the field, um, you know, and it obviously depends what the, client has budget for, but we'd love to do video reports. I mean, we love to do the traditional report, but really do more of a mm -hmm. documentary style um, video capture of, of the consumers. Right. And so that can get really um, creative with tools because we either are working with a professional videographer with, you know, the proper equipment, but sometimes it's just uh, discrete GoPros um, mm -hmm. or even little Sony handheld or even on your phone. Um, and also having that audio recorder ready uh, always because sure. in the field you could take an Uber pool ride and conduct an interview, you know, on your 15 minute transition and, and have that recorder ready. Um, and off or online, uh, 
the way that we're doing it now is again, it's very much manual. Um, so you could source, you know, as many people as you want to, to boost up the, um, internet research. I mean, it's literally time in the saddle of reading and, and knowing the lens of what you're, what you're looking for, what types of topics you're looking for. Um, and so then you're coming up with a list of the uh, keywords that related to your project and yeah. topics. So often, I guess, step one would be figuring out which platforms probably have the best chance of having that topic mm. talked about. So for example, like, you know, let's say it's a lifestyle brand, um, mm -hmm. maybe it's fashion or fitness. So Instagram, there, you're going to have a ton of uh, influence, influencers, but also relevant posts with a ton of commentary. Mm -hmm. Whereas something like retirement packages, Instagram is probably not going to be so fruitful, yep. but book reviews were. So step one would be kind of try to narrow down the platforms that you think are going to have um, robust information. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's going in and searching with the, the keywords. And that can be challenging because sometimes, you know, it's, it's long in a thread. I mean, you're truly just reading all of these conversations. Um, and then what I like to do is pull all of that information to a master Excel so you don't lose the, the target source and you can start isolating these comments and figuring out, okay, in this column, I've got the verbatim, what was actually said, but what is the theme? What's the underlying message that they're saying? And you kind of keep going down and then you start seeing some of these consistencies, you know, on the right side. Trends of, and patterns. Yep. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And then, you know, that then can build out into that um, overarching narrative and story. But are you not, you're not using any social listening platforms in order for extracting the data. You do it manually, right? Manually, yeah. And I know there are companies that do mm -hmm. that, that are running it yep. through and using AI and um, linguistics. And that's great. We, we just do it manually. I think there's still something to be said for mm -hmm. things don't always fit in that package. And sure. you can often miss it. And, you know, at first glance, it might not appear that they're, they're talking about something valuable, but they are in, mm -hmm. in how they said it or what they said. So yeah, it's very much a manual process for us. Yeah, no, I bet it's, but that's how you kind of uh, uncover the gold nuggets. That well, exactly. Sometimes. I think it's a good uh, start, like you were touching on for the small to medium businesses that maybe they don't have, you mm -hmm. know, these robust teams to do it um, or the, the budget to. And that's such a fantastic place to start because then at least once you do um, have the funds to do a full blown uh, qualitative in-person project, you kind of already have the, the theories in place or the foundation in place. So you're not just throwing spaghetti at the wall with questions. You kind of know like, okay, you're testing for or against these different mm -hmm. theories. Right, right. No, that that's absolutely makes sense because yep. I know that uh, a lot of people are scratching their heads about social listening and especially when they are young and just about to start. But the reality that... The data is there. I mean, it's super accessible. You just need to be yep. able to come up with the, the right keywords to kind of narrow your questions and then just, uh, as you said, find the right platform where you think your audience uh, tends to congregate around. Exactly. So. And you can do, I mean, so again, for the small to medium guys, you can do things really scrappy and cheap. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could host a meetup.com event, you know, and structure it where there's an incentive of maybe you're providing the food or the, the mm -hmm. venue and invite people in knowing that they're going to participate in a conversation about whatever your, your topic is. So yeah, right. it's always a shame to hear that things don't work because there isn't a need because all it takes is, is your time and willingness to go out and ask a lot of questions <laughs> to figure sure, it out. Sure, sure. Yeah, so, so now that we touched kind of in a, in a mini misconception uh, about social listening, can, let's uh, blow it up a little bit and say, what is uh, the most uh, common mis misconceptions about ethnography at large, you know, things yep. that they, you come across? Yeah, I'd say the biggest one would be the difference between qualitative and quantitative. Um, so I'm in the qualitative space. And the quantitative space, I mean, is just as valuable. And quantitative meaning, obviously, big numbers, big data. Eight out of 10 people said this or feel this. Um, whereas qualitative is the why. So sometimes we get clients who, who don't necessarily know the difference and they really want to put the qualitative into the quantitative. 
and it's just not how it works because, I mean, it's not statistically relevant. The qualitative serves the purpose to say, to get that's the story. I mean, that's really what it is. It, the qualitative is all about being able to tell the story in, in the color, in the words, in the environment that is important. It's not about saying, um, 80% of the population feels this way. It's saying, okay, once you've narrowed down who you're trying to look at, um, how do you communicate that with them? So, so, mm -hmm. so let me ask you this, you know, if, if that's the case, then um, do you tend to work uh, typically closely with the quantitative team? So basically they go in first, come up with the numbers, and then you come after that and try to, to provide the why to those numbers or? It, yeah, so both ways. So sometimes like, yeah, sometimes a qualitative or quantitative agency will hire us um, as their qualitative to, to put it in, in partnership. Um, and then other times we're totally removed from that and we might get exposed to prior work that's been done. And you see that a lot with um, persona work. And so mm -hmm. they've already taken their customers and they've done a um, quantitative study to figure out different personas. Okay, our customers fit into these four different buckets. And under this bucket, bucket, 80% of them watch Netflix. And under this bucket, um, they're still watching, you know, cable, whatever the, the criteria is. And that's fueled by big data on surveys. Um, and then, so yeah, so then the perfect kind of symbiotic relationship is then we're going in and it's not just, yeah, 80% are watching Netflix, but why, why is it Netflix over, um, regular television? Yeah. Cause I would think that definitely, you know, it's probably better for you not to see the numbers and, yeah. and provide an honest, uh, opinion versus try to match the number the story to the numbers <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> it's an interesting space and i think in the industry they're still we're still trying to figure out how to work together because numbers it's really like left brain right brain right it's taking yeah. the numbers and then the creative and it's not one is not better than the other so yeah the perfect union is when the two teams can really work together and and use the numbers as real data, but then also listen to, it's all well and good that you've got the numbers, but it doesn't mean that it's going to change a behavior. No, for sure. For sure. Yep. Can you tell us a little bit, uh, like one or two examples of the uh, ethnography uh, projects that you really liked or, or if it's not yours, just, uh, you know, examples from the industry? Sure. Yeah. So one, and I have to admit, I love all of my projects. <laughs> so, <laughs> I guess it's easy to answer, but sure. um, one of them was a large, uh, actually it was another entertainment, so TV provider, service provider, and they wanted to understand small towns in America. Um, you could assume that's because that's the population they want to start marketing and, and targeting with their mm -hmm. communications, but also the type of product that they're selling. Um, so I had designed a study that basically sent me and my backpacks across America going to tiny little towns um, wow. in Michigan, Texas, Colorado. And it was great because what I did was, I mean, really narrow the scope by population of the community and then decide the city based on um, the time frame and if they had any events going on. And so in Michigan, they happen to have the Frostbite Festival. And we're talking about like population 2000. So pretty much the entire town was at this Frostbite Festival where there were, wow. um, there was, uh, what do you call it? Outhouse races, ice plunge, uh, ice golf, turkey bowling, where they're taking frozen turkeys and bowling on the ice. Um, and it's great because that's a natural venue where people are open to talk. I mean, everyone's there, you know, I ended up meeting the mayor and police force. And so everybody's out and accessible. Um, and also I'm a small town girl. So that was like speaking to my people. I even found mm. myself approaching people sitting on their porch and just, you know, wa walking up and asking if we could, we could have a chat. Um, and with that same project too, I, I had communicated with some of the tiny little town, uh, Facebook pages. So, um, yeah, counties or towns will have their own Facebook page and sending messages and say, Hey, I'm coming to town. You know, is there anybody maybe in the community that you could set me up with to meet? And I did end up meeting the mayor that way and then got a whole tour of the town, mm -hmm. um, and met some of the prominent business people in that community. So that was just really fun because it was so authentic and so raw and there wasn't, oh, yeah. there were no rules to it. Um, and then another one, so in this one, we'll kind of show how I do use some of the online tools for the work was 
on the West Coast, it was a uh, craft beer brand that wanted to understand how their beer was uh, positioned among all the other craft beers. Um, so it was 15 bars in, forget, three or five days. But anyway, it was a lot of bars in a you short to period. You go to all the fun place, places. That's how you pick a project, sounds like. <laughs> totally. That is primary number one. You shouldn't ever be doing something that is not fun, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, and so that was great because, yeah, the, the observation piece was literally sitting at the bar and watching what people are drinking and, and conversing with them because they're also sitting at the bar. But I also used um, some of the different social apps to help uh, boost the recruit to get people to come and actually meet me there. So mm. believe it or not, Tinder. Um, and I know people are going to, oh, that's just for the young people. No, you can set the preferences. You can make Tinder whatever you want it. And it becomes a revolving door of interviews because you're honest about what you're doing in your profile. Hey, it might be market research related. I'll buy your beer. Come talk to me for 20 minutes or it's always more than 20 minutes, but whatever it is. Um, and I just get to sit there and wait for people to come to me. Mm. So same thing, couch surfing. Couch surfing, you don't only use couch surfing to stay the night with people. There's discussion boards, uh, community boards where you can post, Hey, Hey guys, you give me advice on the best craft beer in, uh, you know, whatever city. Um, and then you get all these people giving you advice and telling you places mm -hmm. to check out. And then it's like, okay, cool guys. I'm going to be here at this time between these times. If you come on over, I'll buy you a beer. And again, it's like, you're getting these, these apps to work for you in a very natural and organic way. Yeah, because you're kind of leveraging the local intelligence to kind of yeah. get the advice. And once you get the advice, is you just open the door for kind of the face-to-face -face interaction. Exactly. Yep, that's exactly. Cool. That's awesome. So, mm -hmm. so when you have a, a project completed, we understand now how you work, you know, what is the end-to-end -end process looks like, mm -hmm. the business objectives. Uh, How's the outcome looks like? You know, what, how your report looks like? Uh, how do you measure success? Yeah, yeah, and that's a tricky one because, well, first of all, just tangibly, yeah, the report is kind of twofold. So we do, well, I think they're spectacular reports because it's less about all the words and more about even having the report tell the story with really simple mm -hmm. um, edgy titles and then just enough with the verbatims and some photos and things like that. But the, um, the video also then really, really does justice. And when clients are open to it, which we always appreciate and like is when they want to be involved in the, in the process. So even like going back to, um, the cross country, small town research, part of the deliverable was less about what I put on paper after the fact. And it was more about me taking some of the people from, you know, their boardroom, let's just say out into the field and, and joining me. So I'm taking them on this experience, um, where they get to live and breathe mm -hmm. what the consumers are saying, um, in a comfortable and safe way, because I've really done the work to align, uh, the people that we're meeting and where we're going and those, those soft in introductions. So that's very much part of it too. And then other times, again, it depends what the client wants, but it could be, um, a, a workshop. So you've, deliver the results, but then you might spend a day um, in the boardroom just workshopping different ideas where, where you, we really don't try to tell a, a business what they should do. We're very much the objective, here's the data, here's what we heard, unbiased, but it's, it's your job to figure out how that fits with your business strategy and where you want to go with it. But the nice thing about the workshop is just you, when you hear them kind of going off in one direction, you're like, okay, no, but, but this is really what we heard. Um, and that can be important because it's really hard for brands to let go of their babies and let go of their ideas that they have mm. spent a lot of time working on. And, and the beauty of being an outside party is I, I don't really care. I'm going to report on the objective findings and I don't have any stake in the company to, to lose position. And I can say the things that, yep. that need to be said. Um, you're representing mm. the customer voice in essence, basically. Exactly. Mm -hmm. What was the last part of your question? I went on my tangent. In terms of, you know, how do you measure success? Do you oh, have yeah. like a specific categories that you deliver every time? So, yeah. And that was tricky because, because it's not numbers based because it's qualitative. So mm -hmm. like I was saying earlier, yep. you can find the voice that will back up whatever you want to hear. So you'll always find someone that believes in, in what you believe. Um, and so I guess, I don't know. It, it, 
success is, is on different levels. Like for me, I feel very successful when we get deep, rich insights. And when we get that story that the uh, client had no idea about, mm -hmm. or we see the client the blind spots, totally. Yep. Yeah. Or you mm -hmm. thought they thought about it this way, but they really don't. Um, so the quality of insights to me is success again, because I don't necessarily, I don't have a hand in what they do with that after. Um, right. and that's for them to fight out in, in the boardroom. But then it is always an extra kudos when you see the foundation of your work turn into a commercial or turn into a new product. product yeah. Um, you feature. Yep. Yeah. And you can, and you know, Oh, they made those changes because of this research. And so, I mean, that's the ideal uh, signal of success along with getting the, the phone call back for a second project. No, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's, that's cool. So, so you've been in the space now for a couple of years and yeah. most likely exposed to where it's headed, but any inklings to, you know, how the future looks like for ethnographic research mm -hmm. and what type of tools uh, people like yourself would use. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I do. And I have lots of entrepreneurial ideas that I'm selfishly being very, uh, hidden yeah. about, but I, general I, idea. <laughs> yeah, in general, I think <laughs> in the VR space is really interesting, mm -hmm. um, which it's already happening. So I know, um, I think it's still early stage, but like you can put on the VR headset and your consumer can like shop the grocery store aisle, you know, virtually, which is all well and good, but I almost, I want to use it for the storytelling. I think it would be really interesting to be delivering reports in that, in a VR experience rather than just flat video. Mm -hmm. um, so I definitely think, yeah, there's more space to go there. I'm hoping that, um, that the human side of it is never, you know, outdated. I, I think partly job security, but also I believe in the fact that technology can only do so much and, and you need that human, human to human interaction. Yep. Mm -hmm. But I do think just overall, at least in, in my experience in the industry, um, there's so much room to do things in really unique, innovative, non-traditional ways. So like, for example, if you're doing a liquor project, rent out a bar and host your focus group at the bar and get someone to be the bartender and, you know, create that real space. So I feel like those methodologies aren't happening enough. Yeah. I think to, to your point, I think what you're saying in essence is that, every time you want to kind of get yourself embedded into your target customer environment, you, you want to be, you want to play a role in whatever they're already doing. So how can yep. you dramatize, you know, this environment from the get go? Yep. So instead of just waiting in line with somebody, how about if you create, you know, the environment, uh, the destination environment, like a bar that he's going to, end up with exactly and and but so basically it's like kind of bringing the volume a yep. little bit on a larger scale than just uh, using the existing uh, settings exactly and then another um i think area that that should continue evolving is with the recruiting side of it so i do a lot of stuff in in like in-person recruiting, literally intercepting someone on the street and asking them to talk to me. But there's still going to be the time and place to pay the recruiting company to get the 15 people that meet, you know, the screener criteria and X, Y, and Z um, background elements. Um, but I think that there's a lot that could be done with utilizing, uh, you know, influencers on social media, influencers who have an uh, active audience. I mean, especially on Instagram. Mm -hmm. So 100,000 people watching their profiles. And let's say, it is a lifestyle, I don't know, let's pretend it's a food brand. Um, if you can connect with an influencer that's willing to, to post uh, that opportunity on your behalf, then you have a whole new database of potential respondents that aren't in the current company's mm -hmm. databases. So that's something too that happens is the, the same people are getting pooled to do interviews because they're these existing databases. So I think um, new ways to get people into research to be participants um, is ripe, ripe for doing it differently than how it's been done. One thing is, uh, I know that, uh, I forgot how it's called, I think it's Amazon uh, Torque. 
Okay. Where people can pose a question and, uh, you know, they get a lot of feedbacks. Typically, developers are using it for starring a, a new prototype. Yeah. So that's one thing that I've heard that's been uh, super successful and it's kind Smart. of the open source, uh, open community. Smart. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is uh, another area that's uh, also kind of uh, started to... Uh, are you using anything with the mobile to basically mobile is really like we are connected to it 24 yeah, totally. seven, but anything you do with mobile? Um, we do. And there's a ton of different third party platforms that make it really easy for you. So um, I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, yeah, they've made it really easy where the respondent can, you know, download the app and um, basically do lots of things. They could, like daily check-ins and react to questions in real time. So maybe it's a week long study and the person participating is on their app and they have to go shopping and they have to take photos of what they looked at and they have to um, uh, upload little, upload little video, you know, how am I feeling today? Um, or you could push them real time questions on, you know, that they have to answer through the app. Um, so yeah, there's a ton of platforms that, that act as a service to the researcher to be able to, um, interact with people that way. And that's, again, comes down to just the methodology. That would be like, okay, we're using this as the methodology to, to collect insights. Um, and I guess another way that I've used it, it's a bit of a tangent though, because it goes back to the social platforms, but Snapchat, for example, um, if I don't want to you know, pay for that third-party platform, people already understand Snapchat and it's all built in. You can download that video. You can put an awesome geo filter on it. So then in your uh, cumulative report of a bunch of videos, it has the filter of where they are and you see a nice, um, uh, what do I say? Like prove that you've spoken to people from X, Y, and Z location. Right, um, right, right. And it's a platform that they already understand how to, how to use to take that video of themselves talking about whatever topic and download an email. So there's, there's definitely ways to just use the basics. Absolutely. Well. And speaking about videos, uh, obviously when you report your uh, results, you mentioned you use videos and, and I assume this is kind of the, the raw video footage of uh, people saying, what, you know, whatever they thought about uh, yep. questions that you raised. Did you see examples where uh, ethnographic uh, research turned into like a whole brand, like a, like a, documentary like a whole doc narrative documentary which is edited as, as a film and not just as a raw oh, film. I don't know I would love to do that with with all of my projects yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah basically it's like the making of or yeah. behind the scene of and you know, totally you know, yeah and I think it thought. it would be cool I mean that it's always you know tough with the NDAs and the the research has to stay oh yeah hyper confidential with whoever's hiring you but yeah. i do do a lot of passion um projects so i think yeah that that could be really cool and i suppose i mean it's journalism really yeah. exactly yeah. cool all right so i want to thank you so much for a fantastic time today you know thank i you. learned a, a ton from you know this fascinating work that you do and you know i hope to continue uh, staying in touch and even collaborate at some point and and for our audience that uh, have been watching or listening, if they want to ask you some questions, how can they be, contact you? They can stalk me on whatever social media platform they want. Um, <laughs> should I share my email and just say it out loud? Oh, sure, yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, it would be Tori, mm -hmm. T-O-R-Y dot Gentis, which is G-E-N-T-E-S, at the palmerstongroup.com um, but you can also find me on linkedin tori gentis tori mm -hmm. with a y not an i yep um find me on facebook under the same name <laughs> instagram same name awesome good stuff <laughs> all right thank you so much this was cool. fun thank you all right and for all of you watching and listening uh, we'll catch you up in the next episode of visual storytelling today thank you bye, -bye. thank you bye
Visual Storytelling Today is recorded in Miami, Florida. The show is published exclusively by Visual Storytelling Institute. Learn more at visualstorytell.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on the iTunes Store. Until next time, don't let your big story wait to be told.